So yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think also when we think about CNS activity, I was very skeptical about adding that to have early on with whether it had CNS activity or not. It's a large bi-specific antibody. You know, we, we know that monoclonal antibodies don't necessarily penetrate the CNS, but on Mariposa 2, the second line trial, we clearly saw benefits. And then in Mariposa, the data was quite striking. So Eddie, I'll come to you on this here. The CNS efficacy for AMI labs, uh, PFS, intracranial PFS, was quite impressive. There was a doubling at three years of patients who were intracranial progression free for those receiving amidanzumab and lizardinib versus those receiving osimertinib. How does that compare with the data from Flora 2? And so how do you utilize that data when you think about patients in your clinical trials? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Joshua. So basically, a when you see Flora 2 and Amylase, both of them has a activity in the brain. Uh, when you see the uh, subgroup analysis by progression free so, so survival and look those patients that have CNS meds, they both of them favor the combination therapy over osimertib. Okay, there's no question about that. But when we are going to talk about intracranial PFS, the advantage goes to the Mariposa trial, how the study was designed. Because it's the only study that we have in non small cell lung cancer prospective uh, analysis in which every patient had MRI a, a rigorous done. So every patient in Mariposa has MRI at baseline. And if the patient has a brain metastasis, there was a very rigorous follow up of uh, MRI. Like all those patients has a MRI, if I'm not mistaken, every 8 or 12 weeks, only up to 30. Uh, month of therapy and after that every six months so it's a serial MRI so we can quote specifically what is really the intracranial progression free survival so that's the advantage that Mariposa has I would say over any other study that we have in non small cell cancer and you were very correct so at three years all those patients in that analysis that has brain meds when you compare amylase versus osimertinib 36% of the patients, they do not have any progression in the brain versus 18% only for that group that were almost imertinib. Another thing I want to call attention is on the course of this intracranial PFS. We know that a median PFS of uh, amylase is 23.7 months. You can use two years, 24 months. After that, all those patients were out of any amylase and the curve started to separate when you see this intracranial PFS between amylase versus osimertinib. Why is that? And then you start to see a little plateau, but it's very interesting. So again, uh, Joshua and my colleagues, yeah, in this regard on intracranial PFS, we can clearly, precisely say what is really the PFS. Because you can have a patient with no brain meds, okay, and then the patient develops some symptoms. How long the patient has had these brain meds developing in the brain? Or vice versa, you can have a patient with brain meds, you give an active therapy, patient go asymptomatic, but if you don't follow the patient, you're like, we did Mariposa, how can you talk about intracranial PFS? So again, uh, the advantage goes on Mariposa just based on the design of the crime. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the, the PFS curve for intracranial PFS for Abivantan and Lazarder does seem to sort of plateau. Uh, Eric, your thoughts on, is that driving the overall survival? And, you know, how important is CNS coverage and activity in your clinical practice? Yeah, I, I think CNS coverage and really thinking about that concern is of the utmost importance, especially for patients with BGF positive disease. Um, I will really echo what Eddie has said about the Mariposa study design. I really appreciate that we get those granular details with serial mandated brain MRIs. So that's the way that studies should be done in space. There's a really nice study that just came out a few months ago over MSK where they looked at what is the incidence of development of CNS disease? The patients that have EGFR positive disease at a single institution, it was MSK. And what they saw was at five years or by five years, 54% of patients on those 54% of patients are going to have CNS disease and 12% with LMD. So this is a very clear need for our patients. When they do develop CNS disease, can have a real impact on their quality of life. Many of these patients are young, they're caregivers, they've got family members that they're taking care of. And so when they develop CNS disease, it can really impact what's going on in their day to day. And so I think it's out of this. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, the two things for me that really worry me when I meet an EGFR mutation patient, especially thinking about historically third generation EGFR TKI alone is the CNS, uh, LMD, leptomeningeal disease, but also histologic transformation. And I think with amivantamem and lizardinib, maybe we're starting to see a change in the biology. We don't have prospective data on decreased rates of small cell transformation, but you know, it is interesting to start to think about 
You know, we need to have better therapeutic options for our patients that do truly change the biology of the disease. You know, Alex, your, your thoughts on amivantamab penetrating the blood-brain barrier? Yes, no. Uh, is it treating extracranial disease, preventing CNS? Um, what are your thoughts? Yes, to both. I think it's doing both. You know, I think, uh, you know, the parion, as we talked about before, of monoclonals not getting into the CNS is just not there. I mean, antibody drug conjugates, there's a whole literature right now, metritimab, datapotimab, and not to focus today's discussion, but we all said, you know, these drugs aren't going to get in. They do the studies on like, they actually do get in a little bit. The amount they get in is unclear. Whether, how they're getting in is not really understood, really hard studies to do. But suffice to say, in a proportion of patients, they do. But also we know if you decrease the burden of systemic disease, that's going to prevent the, the CNS shedding as well. So I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's more probably systemic disease than anything else. But we are seeing, you know, we're seeing single agent responses with amabans and amabans and ADCs as well. So clearly it's. Yeah. And one thing I, when I talk to colleagues, there's a lot of discussion on, is it lizertinib that's penetrating the blood-brain barrier? And clearly lizertinib, similar to osimertinib, a third generation EGFR inhibitor has great CNS penetration. But when you look at the subset analyses of patients with CNS metastases on the Mariposa trial, and you look at Amilaz versus Ossie alone, Ossie alone is only 13 months median progression-free survival in patients who have CNS metastases. So clearly, amivatimab is building upon lizertinib in this patient population. So, you know, there is an improvement both in PFS and overall survival for both amivatimab and lizertinib, as well as we said, Flora 2 for osimertinib and chemo. Um, I think these are the standards of care in practice now in 2025. Alex, how do you differentiate those two regimens when you have a patient sitting in front of you in clinic? Are you looking at high-risk subsets? Are you discussing sort of the regimen and, and sort of side effect profile? How does your discussion, what does it look like in your practice? So it's a complicated discussion. And, you know, as much as we want to do shared decision-making, you know, it's a little bit of, an, uh, of a poor term because at the end of the day, you know, when your plumber comes in and then gives you, you know, which water heater do you want to put in, you're really relying on their expertise. So yes, it's shared decision-making and it's hard. I try and get a sense of what they want when they walk in the door. How I just saw somebody the other day and it was clear and she made it clear to me that she really wanted to just quality of life and less time in the doctor's office. And that was an easy decision. So you have to have that sense of then kind of tailor to what they want. It'll get a lot easier once we get the sub Q and we am going to talk a lot about pulling through you then in a few minutes because a lot of that is time in the clinic, time spent, you know, in doing that. And that'll make that part a whole lot easier. But it's a little bit of shared decision making, talking about what they want, what are the side effects are, how they view it as well.